Um, can we open it up for questions? Now, people, you can ask questions about any aspect of, uh, of our discussion, but do take advantage of the fact that there is an agent in the room. That's a rarity. Stop, stop, stop. I'm kind of one of those independent guys that has a brother in Brooklyn that's helping with some of the transmission components. <laughs> and uh, my name is Orlando Rivera, frankenson.com. Uh, and essentially, I'm putting together our up material. We got a script. We're doing all these pieces. And we've been talking an awful lot of that because we came out of the comic books and window development days and game developers and all that stuff. Sure. So now we've been talking about this, and now I can use a name for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it mm -hmm. makes it a little more viable. So from an independent perspective, as we're trying to have this, this film component, which is sort of the heart of all of this, it seems like that would be where everything would spiral from or be connected somehow. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see, uh, I, I probably couldn't afford a guy like you, so we sort of have to do it the other way. So uh, what, what resources and what guidance you give the guys who have a much smaller budget, who are heading off to uh, American film market to see if anybody was to give us some money to do this, <laughs> what, what would be some of those components that could, could they make this real so that we can extend sure. our little franchise? And right. Make it? Um, well, actually, there, there are some excellent um, uh, resources that are out there. My advice would be to, uh, to key into the, the transmedia community. There's a growing uh, community right here in New York City. There's a transmedia meetup. You just look these things up. Um, if on, uh, on Twitter, hashtag transmedia, if you do a search and just look every day there, there's a, there'll be a hundred little uh, tweets with articles, um, a, a lot of which are about independent transmedia uh, storytelling. Um, uh, uh, our own uh, Caitlin Burns at Starlight Runner Entertainment independently is creating a transmedia implementation she calls Jurassic Park Slope. <laughs> Check it out, man. It's, it's hilarious. It has a lot to say about gentrification and politics and things like that. And there are dinosaurs. Um, so um, uh, it, it's, it's great and it's, it's generated incredible uh, attention. Uh, she's doing it for nothing. You know, uh, I, I think the whole month's worth of, of implementation has cost her 10 grand. Um, but it's a lot of fun, and it is establishing her as a transmedia producer, and it's increased her credit and so forth. Um, uh, there are articles on uh, independent filmmakers and transmedia on, on uh, websites like transmythology.com uh, that are uh, fantastic, and just, just uh, explore out there. The, the, uh, the body of information about this technique is not so large that you couldn't absorb all of it in, in the next uh, couple of months. Jeff, you made a comment earlier about there's nothing uh, more powerful than the written word. And I know the focus here is mostly on the film side. I'm curious what either of you have seen from the publishing world. We know that Random House, Macmillan have set up variations on uh, film imprints and Macmillan's is Sounds like it might be a transmedia approach. What have you seen from the publishing side? And as an agent, I'm particularly curious, what, what are you seeing from any potential competition with straight literary agents versus someone like you who might be representing both sides? Uh, we, we're, we're seeing a lot of this. I mean, uh, two years ago, um, the, the only transmedia anything out of publishing was the 39 Clues. Um, uh, which, which did okay. I mean, that, that came out and DreamWorks uh, uh, snapped it up almost immediately. Um, uh, was that implementation entirely successful? I don't know, um, but I'm, I'm a little biased because uh, they, they didn't want my story. Um, but um, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, two years later, um, like you said, almost every major publishing house is, uh, is engaging in some kind of a multi-platform approach. Some of them are wildly misguided. We'll talk face to face. Um, but, but others are, um, are striking up deals uh, through agencies and, and directly with studios. And, and, and that's uh, fascinating because uh, um, what they're doing is they're, um, they're incentivized to do this by uh, conducting slightly different deals. They're, they're getting uh, equity in the intellectual property. Um, and cutting themselves in, which is unusual for publishers. And agents usually don't want that out of uh, publishers. But the publisher is, seems to be using a bit of muscle 
um, to, to approach the big uh, agencies and the big studios. So uh, everyone's kind of teaming up to allow for that uh, possibility. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the only thing I would add is, you know, we have a fantastic relationship with uh, the literary agents uh, uh, at UTA. Uh, in fact, purposefully, we don't have a publishing division. Uh, we don't represent authors to be published specifically because we don't want to be in competition with those publishing agents. If we have clients, celebrities, whoever it might be, uh, that have an idea for a book, what we'll do is partner them up with the right publishing agent. And we do all of that because what we want is for those publishing agents to look at us as nothing resembling you know, a, a conflict or a competitor, so that when they have something that they love, transmedia or otherwise, that they want to take the film or television, that they steer those clients and those properties towards us. So uh, you know, we represent and have represented a number of the, the, the most influential uh, publishing works over the past few years, and they've turned into you know pretty big franchises, or will become pretty big franchises. We believe, um, so we don't think there's a conflict. We love our relationships with the publishing world here. My question is um, about where you think that the big ideas are coming from, and I'm saying this because I have uh, two graphic novels. I've done Comic Con. Uh, I'm not a superhero a writer. Uh, one graphic novel is based on a story about Africa, and I found that Comic Con doesn't really go for. African stories that go for superheroes, uh, and yet comic cons are crowded. Um, and and at the same time, I've I've had my books published on uh, Graphically, which is a new platform, and um, no one seems to know where, where this is coming from. And they're going to sell what 30, 40 million iPads this year. The the world's going to be a wash in these readers. Uh, it's not movies anymore. It's not books anymore. And everyone that I talk to, for example, my books have music with them, and there are some live shows attached to them. I have another one about Wall Street, believe it or not, there's a comedy and music attached to that. Uh, the publishers don't want music. And, and so no one seems to have put it together in the existing world, and no one's talking about this uh, convergence in a way that's it's real. I mean, there are 30 million iPads coming, and no one seems to really understand, at least in a sort of a business world, where to go. And I've spoken to agents, you're unusual, but for the most <laughs> part, they don't get it. So I help me, how, well, how are you thinking about this? I mean. We're going to be awash with these things. In fact, in, by uh, 2013, there'll be more people using their mobile phones than going to the computers. That's, That's according right. to Google. Yeah. It, it's, it's funny, I'm, I'm echoing your sentiment. First of all, you seem to be a sort of transmedia producer uh, all on your own. You're using tr traditional media, but you've, you've, you've got it, so I'm, I'm giving you kudos. Thank you. Um, uh, and it's, it's shocking to me the dearth of... Uh, of of creatives. There are some companies that have been funded that are researching ways to, to leverage narrative on uh, things like uh, uh, tablets. But, um, but where's, uh, again, where's that Mozart? Where's that person who's going to start weaving that content uh, together so that different applications on an iPad uh, could create these uh, highly immersive experiences that, um, that play with narrative in ways that haven't been done before. Uh, we haven't uh, quite seen that yet, but they are coming. Uh, I promise you that. And that is the essence, the core of this uh, discussion here tonight and why all of you out there are relevant, at least to me. Now, Agent, poke a hole in my balloon. <laughs> I was going to say, I would settle for Stevie Wonder. But. No, I think, listen, you said it very well. Um, you know, I get back to what I said probably a little bit earlier. Um, transmedia, traditional media, film, film, TV, comics, it comes down to story, right? It comes down to quality. It comes down to having a really special, unique asset. Um, every movie that's been made, whether it turned out to be amazing or whether it turned out to be a piece of crap, um, it started with someone saying and thinking to themselves, someone in a decision-making position, this is really special. This has the potential to be really fantastic. Um, and that's what it comes down to. And I think that that's why I said before, um, it can't just be an idea where someone's thought out all the different platforms. Like, something about it's got to be done in such an exceptional way. And listen, I've seen lots of comic books that have been turned into you know really fantastic film and TV projects. I think one of my favorite comic adaptations ever was Road to Perdition, and it was the antithesis of a superhero movie. There you go. But it was yeah. really, really good. And it didn't sell a lot of uh, units. It didn't have a huge worldwide fan base. Um, you know, when I sold Scott Pilgrim 
which was then a little-known comic book, having sold just a few thousand copies to Universal back in 1990, no, I'm sorry, 2004. Uh, it didn't have a big audience. I guess it has superhero tendencies, um, but uh, it's certainly not guy in tights. Um, but somebody thought there was a really unique special story there. And in the years that have passed since then, but before the movie was released, it sort of played itself out. I mean, it became one of the most successful indie comic books of the past decade because mm -hmm. it was just so unique and the story and the characters were so great. So if you're comic book set in Africa or, or whatever it is, you know, it all starts from the same place. I think someone just has to look at it and share your vision that it's something special. And if they do, you know, you could be off to the races. I was hoping it would be you. <laughs> I, I, I would not limit yourself um, it, it, uh, simply because you are not versed in what it takes to create a, an, an iPad application. Um, there's always somebody who understands how to do that and can do it inexpensively. And if you seek that person out and join forces with that person and DIY a little bit, you can uh, come up with something. We're in, on that cusp right now that still allows for miraculous things to emerge um, a, a out of a DIY mentality. He's publishing through Graphically, which I think is a fantastic solution for people that are looking to do sort of e-publishing and comic books. I think they're a great young company. Mm -hmm. uh, graphically, uh, uh, they should give me stock for saying this. Uh, <laughs> I don't represent them. Uh, Graphic.ly. It seems like there's a fairly sort of intuitive relationship, like you were saying, with sort of entertainment properties finding ways to be transmedia. You know, they're not going to spend 500 million on Avatar and not think of other places for it to live. But um, you also had up there Happiness Factory and some things for Nike and so forth. I was curious about how you've approached sort of non-narrative consumer brands and sold them on the notion of the benefits of transmedia and, and how to bring a that's story a great to, to a brand that's more of a consumer brand than sort of a narrative entertainment brand. Absolutely. In the case of, uh, of Coca-Cola and Happiness Factory, that was truly a visionary uh, uh, marketer. Um, um, uh, Jonathan Mildenhall at, at Coca-Cola uh, uh, saw, uh, basically took one sentence that we gave him in an initial presentation. Um, you know, we don't want to be interrupted uh, um, in our entertainment to look at your 30 seconds anymore. <laughs> Um, uh, we want you to create something so interesting that we would actually stop what we're doing and go check it out. Um, and, and the only thing that will really do that, besides some kind of gimmick, which will only last for a few seconds, is a story. And he said, soul, let's go. And, um, and, and so we began to conceive of, of Happiness Factory as a global implementation, um, but only after we engendered the trust and faith of all of the Coca-Cola company. How do you do that? By convincing them that you fundamentally understand the essence of the brand. You tell them what you think the archetype is and the aspirational drivers and all that sort of thing, and they go, wow, you're right, we trust you. <laughs> um, now, can you infuse all of that and, and make Coca-Cola show up as much as humanly possible in this story. <laughs> um, and we go, yeah, but not to the point where it um, interrupts the flow of, of the narrative. You've got to give us a little wiggle room. And, um, and they said, OK. And, um, and that implementation globally boosted the sales of Coke across a quarter by four percentage points. That's a lot of sugar water. A lot. Um, so uh, can, uh, being able to uh, um, uh, form a bond of trust, uh, being able to tell the ad agency that you're not there to supplant them, you're there to connect them with the audience using longer forms of narrative, which are elements that they're not used to working with. And, um, um, and that's how we kind of walk that tightrope between Wyden and Kennedy, Coca-Cola, the animation house, and so forth. OK? Yeah. Hi, Marge Kleinman. Uh, the documentary community has been moving in this direction for quite a while, as you probably know. Um, but we, we face the challenge of not having giant franchises with merchandising and all that. It's much less commercial. I'm just wondering if you can share some success stories you've seen from the nonfiction community or insights that you're seeing sure. about where it's well, heading. Sure. We, well, we, we're actually engaged in, in a couple of these things, which 
I haven't told my agent about <laughs> because they pay. I mean, you're cutting me out of the commission. <laughs> they pay like nothing, <laughs> so there is no commission. <laughs> Sorry. You can leave me out of it then. <laughs> See, I like him for that. <laughs> Mercenary. Uh, no. Um, the the. Uh... <laughs> so here's here's an example. Um, the, the PBS documentary Wham Bam Islam um, <laughs> about the superhero property The 99 um, is, a, is a documentary that's going to air on PBS and they came to us because they wanted a transmedia implementation. There was going to be enough in the budget to actually pay for the implementation of, uh, on a couple of different media platforms. And, um, and they said, can you whip up some games, some flash games for us? Because that was their impression of, of transmedia. Uh, we said, well, who's your target audience? And they said, well, uh, adults are going to watch this show. And we said, well, why would we do the flash games? Let's, let, let's get to the essence of what it is that your documentary is about, which is the, um, uh, the union of East and, and West pop culture. Um, and let's start a dialogue uh, about that. And we developed a little um, a multi-platform uh, uh, method to get uh, uh, young people in the Middle East, in schools, to communicate uh, with school kids in the United States about superheroes and about um, uh, their culture, their popular culture, not their high art stuff and, and so forth. And it gave, it's going to be giving them a bond of, of trust and a bond of, of dialogue um, to enjoy. And that will be an offshoot that will actually uh, last longer than, than Wham Bam Islam. It's, 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 going, to, it's going to happen. Um, sorry about the pronunciation, but um, uh, because it doesn't work. But um, but you know, um, and and that was very inexpensive uh, for them to to carry off, and and it worked. And and we're doing this with a few different uh, documentary things. So it's it's just a matter of applying a little imagination, and taking the things that we talked about, the essence of the message, and extending it so that it's not a silly flash game. But not everything should be, needs to be. True. can be a successful transmedia franchise. Uh, some just aren't supposed to be. I can think of some really fantastic uh, documentaries that could be. Um, you could imagine in Super Size Me if prior to production he had set up a fund and gotten people from all over the country or the world and said, I'll pay for your free McDonald's for the next <laughs> however many months if you agree <coughs> to film yourself and chart yourself and send me stuff. Uh, and all those assets were available, and if he set up a community online, I mean, there was a lot of things That's you could do, something cool. like that, right? <laughs> or, or, or an inconvenient truth. You can imagine the narrative that runs through that. Um, but then there's some things, and I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but there's some that probably don't benefit from a transmedia campaign. The idea, while intriguing for a 90 or 120 minute doc, probably isn't the type of narrative that people are going to chase once they leave the movie theater, the way you're going to chase Star Wars, Star Trek, Harry Potter. Um, or even supersize me. So I think not everything is designed to be that, and I think that is also That's um, fine. one of the things that people have to understand. And, and again, yeah, totally fine. It doesn't mean Individual that... Individual instruments can make beautiful music. Absolutely. Last couple of questions. Sure, and uh, basically piggybacking on what you've just been talking about, when it doesn't work, what do you learn from that uh, as a transmedia producer? Because not everything is really meant for that that multi-pronged approach right so where have you f you know failed fast or had a had a struggle where they really wanted to push for this approach yet it really hasn't gelled into the heart of the story the soul of the brand interesting um yeah that's a good question i don't know i mean i think just like success tends to be a sort of unique beast failure does as well, and I think that most people who have gone through failure, myself included, would say they've learned more from the losses than they have from the wins. Um, I think that if I had to guess, if you gave me a hundred transmedia projects, none of which were successful, however you would define success, and asked me to find what was in common amongst them all, it would probably be the thing I keep harping on, which is the lack of a really interesting, engaging, unique, powerful franchise story uh, that was artfully told. I think that I'd be shocked if, you know, 
a really talented transmedia production team went to Warner Brothers and pitched a franchise, and they said, yeah, we love the movie and the TV component, and we think it could be a, a smash hit on a video game, but we really think you miss the beat on the mm -hmm. comic book, so we're going to pass. <laughs> um, I think at the end of the day, there's a kernel of an idea that, pe that is going to inspire people or not, and when it does, you know, you got lightning in a bottle, and when it doesn't, I don't think it's necessarily about tweaking process or getting a better storyboard artist next time. I think it's about, you know, just keep working right, until right. you find that idea that's going to move people. Um, Starlight Runner has actually, in, in my book, failed twice in, in the past decade. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that we, we're doing, you know, a million properties and failed too. Um, we, we only do a few a year. The, the ones where we failed were when we were called in um, to develop transmedia so late in, in the production that our insertion threatened everyone uh, involved. Um, well, who are you and why are you trying to change what it is that we've uh, established? And, um, um, and th there were times where no matter what we did, no matter how much we said, no, but we really like your story, um, it's got a lot of potential, let us open it up, let us uh, do things to, to create avenues for other media platforms, um, their response was, no, thank you. Or, yeah, go ahead and, and write it, but we're not going to use it. <laughs> you know, that, that kind of, which happened. And, and, um, it's not the story that's not successful. It's the story between the individual. That's right. That's right. It, it, it is a, a visionary who really only wants to be, to, to play with his own toys. Jeff's the beauty pageant contestant who only lost because he was too pretty. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Wow, get him. <laughs> um, one more uh, point and then I'm going to make a few last remarks. I'm trying to crack this nut from a producer's perspective. And w when we're putting together our chain of title for a project in the beginning or talking to a writer, it, is this, is transmedia like an ancillary right? Or how, do, how does it break down? Cool. Negotiating with it, uh, or does it, or is that just totally off base? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, when it comes time to sell it, um, yeah, you better have all that taken care of because there's nothing that spooks off a studio quicker than chain of title problems. Um, so I think what you're asking is, as you're bringing on different people to participate in the pre-funding development of your project, a writer, et cetera, do you need to, you know, is there a separate sort of contract for transmedia, and does that get low? Basically, yeah. anything, anytime you're having someone work on the project, if it's your project, if you desire to control it at the end of the day, you need to make sure all that work is work for hire, that you have the ability to make decisions as it relates to the disposition of the property unilaterally. You can give away as much equity in that property as you want, as long as it's totally passive and those people don't have any right to block. I would never promise people credits on future works. I would never promise people fees on future works because the truth is you have no control over it. You can tell someone, yeah, if it gets set up as a TV series, you can be an executive producer and we'll give you X. You have no clue. That's 20th Television's decision. And the last thing you want is a television studio wanting to buy your property but having to pass because they don't want to eat the credit and the fee that you promised to some guy in you know, the Bronx who said he would help you with transmedia. Um, <laughs> although I heard there's great transmedia in the Bronx. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I would just be very, very careful. I think that, you know, and actually this is something, you know, Jeff and I had a business meeting before we came here with his partner uh, and we went through a number of the outstanding projects and some things that were on the table. And there were a couple of things that, I don't mind saying, um, I, poo pooed a little bit because I sniffed some, not chain of title problems per se, but um, increasingly complex layers of pre-financing producers. Is that a simple way of saying it? Um, you know, and, and, a railroad train load yeah, of them. <laughs> you know, and, and, and again, um, listen, I'm not the expert. Right? I'm just a guy who puts a suit on and does my best every day. Um, but, you know, I do believe that Hollywood is a business of no more than it's a business of yes. I think that there's a lot of people who have a lot of great ideas and a lot of great projects, and as opposed to looking someone in the eye and telling you that your project isn't good enough, they look for an idea why something else is better. Um, and knowing that that's the environment that you're working in, don't give them another reason to say no. If they like the project 
don't give them the reason to say no because there's an extra layer of producers or because chain of titles screwed up or because you've given away certain rights. Mm -hmm. It's only going to make your life. It's an uphill battle as it is for me as much as it is for you. Um, you know, ABC will buy 90 scripts, you know, to make, I don't know, I'm making up numbers, 20 pilots to pick up four or five new shows. When they're picking up those 90 scripts, they're looking for reasons to say no to hundreds of others. When they are reviewing those 90 scripts to figure out what 20 pilots they want to make, they're looking for reasons to say no to, you know, whatever, you know, you know most of them. And uh, so don't give them reasons to say no. Um, th there's also the notion that if you're acquiring uh, um, a piece of intellectual property, um, uh, that uh, that it would behoove you nowadays to think about the fact that that it needs to be multi-platform uh, ready, and therefore uh, that your rights are inclusive of of all of those things, and making sure that those those rights are not tied up elsewhere. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There's lots of really fantastic entertainment attorneys here in LA. Um, who may charge you for an hour or two of their time, but getting them to put together an appropriate contract that allows you to either hire people to work on your project um, without uh, damaging your standing uh, or acquiring or licensing or optioning properties to make sure that you're acquiring all the rights so that when you go to Warner Brothers to sell it, you have the full bundle you need. Because um, again, the last thing you want is somebody who you hired who did two months of work for you three years ago holding you hostage when you're trying to make a deal. Right. And I've seen it happen all too often. If you're creative or, or uh, um, uh, a producer of new media content, uh, they're going to offer uh, these fantastic avenues um, uh, to uh, apply your skills. There are new uh, formats that, that we are uh, looking at uh, from some of the larger companies and even from some of the mid-sized uh, companies, uh, companies like Vook. Um, Microsoft is, is developing um, uh, uh, new formats uh, that are uh, fascinating. Some of the mobile uh, phone properties, um, uh, which are allowing for things like multi-app combos that create new and, and immersive uh, experiences. You will be able to enjoy a story um, on a lean back level um, that, that unfolds uh, naturally like a movie that suddenly and almost without warning trips into a console video game experience. Um, that then will toss you onto the internet so that you can communicate with friends and bring them into the experience and then leave your house and seamlessly uh, continue to enjoy uh, that experience, almost creating a kind of alternate reality or, or um, augmented reality uh, experience for you. And this is um, all being uh, uh, assembled right now. It's going to be crude to start with. Um, but, um, but watch it evolve. Uh, participative narrative and uh, user contributions to canon, as I, I talked about before, uh, will be uh, absolutely um, uh, de rigueur. It, it's going to happen within the next uh, four or five years. And, um, and therefore, that communal storytelling that we talked about at the very beginning is, uh, is going to be what's happening now. Um, the, the, it's, it's essentially, I believe, going to become a, a kind of art form where, where some of our greatest storytellers or musicians um, will, uh, will be able to uh, weave these, these kind of narrative symphonies. Um, I do want to caution all, all of us because when you create uh, a text that is compelling and surrounds your audience and immerses them into this experience, it becomes very, very believable, okay? Um, almost like religion. Um, and we have to be careful because um, that's enormously powerful. Um, and transmedia is not going to stay within the confines of the entertainment industry or the advertising industry. It is going to move. We've seen a little hint of it this past summer in politics. Um, and they didn't even coordinate themselves, uh, okay? And, and that can lead to wild misinformation and, um, uh, and, and make people confused or disconnected or really angry, um, and, um, and then we've got problems. So as storytellers, we have to be responsible, and that's why I'm emphasizing the dialogue component, but also emphasizing the fact that we need to ask our audience to ask questions. We have to compel them 
to constantly do a reality check so that we uh, uh, can position ourselves as informed consumers of entertainment content and political content and news and, and so forth. It is vital that we understand um, how this works. Um, when it is well applied, its potential is magnificent. Transmedia applied to educational endeavors um, can truly turn um, uh, kids who are illiterate or ignorant of the outside world into uh, people who are connected and whose questions are being answered and who uh, become empowered. Um, when transmedia is well used, which means that it must have a dialogue component, then um, a whole groups of people, whole nations who have been in the dark, who have been ignored by the rest of the world, will be able to communicate who they are and what they're about to us and learn from us so that they can remove themselves from oppression and extremism. Transmedia storytelling, transmedia narrative uh, can truly uh, bring us peace. So thank you very much, people. We create worlds. If you have further questions about this or truly think that this is meaningful to you, contact me, jeff at starlightrunner.com. <laughs>